Oh, welcome back. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Good Good afternoon, morning. Sir. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma. Doctor, I could see you around here. Good afternoon, ma. Mr. Go, Mr. Olav, where don't start? So, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I welcome us all back to today's webinar. Expected after the awesome one we had the last time. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back, ma. Welcome back, sir. I greet you all. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. So if you are excited to be around today again, please, can we just signal with our emoji, with our voice and everything we got? So, First and foremost, as we ought to be, we have to commit it all unto God. So we pray God take control. So we commend to this webinar to God. We pray it takes over, he, he helps us, he teaches all from he, he teaches us directly from himself through to his daughter, through the doctor through doctors, and we learn and we it we, we get benefited. At his feet in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I welcome us all. I welcome everybody, the new members. I welcome you. The, if, if you are new to um to Saikun, I welcome you. If today is your web day, is your first experience in our webinar, I say welcome. And I be, I'm very sure it's a it, it's a it's a webinar you won't ever get to so forget. It's one out of many that we never, never get to forget. It's awesome, it's educative, and impactful as well. So, first and foremost, I'm going to, um, I'm going to introduce us all into um, what we stand for into Saikun. Although I know we are not new to it, though, but notwithstanding, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce it to us again, just to know what to expect. He gets it's not just a random meeting, it's not some it's not one of those meetings that we believe that um uh, it's just a meeting that is hosted or probably um, established for doing sake. It's actually as a goal, yeah. We have a mission and we stick by it. Praise God. So here is the other thing. Oh, sorry, I said praise God, do I'm not in fast anyways. So yeah, we it's a cool as we, we are a, we are a Nigeria based science club. We give students a place to express their science, scientific curiosity, to, de to develop their scientific knowledge and pursue the interest in engaging scientific activities. So our goal is to host webinars among and beyond the webinars. We do school outreach, we do coach mentorship, we do we do exhibits, quiz, and many others competitions among students, among secondary school. It's far beyond. Um, beyond university settings, yes, our major target is even grooming. It, it goes, it, um, it goes beyond university settings. As I said earlier, on. our targets actually go into the, um, the upcoming students, the upcoming science students, to be able to channel their parts. It gets to be able to channel their parts into 
into their life careers and at the same time into the exposure in um, in, in life science in, in life science related careers and subjects so the, we focus on life science majorly but notwithstanding even though we focus on life science that does not respect us into um into having membership um across other field yes you might um, you might be someone like me who probably uh, who probably not into the life science thoroughly not into the life science career but at the same time you have interest in life science in life science probably you are so inclusive in science related um, matters in science related courses and all that things you get but not really not really interested in probably wanting to establish yourself into a career that is related to life science or prevention wanting to study any courses related to life science that is not an that is not an issue at all that is not even a problem in fact we are there for you in terms of probably helping you helping you to shape your your curiosity into beneficial parts of which you could literally link it up into your career path and at the same time probably help you to, to to sharpen up your curiosity into into the part of which we help you um, probably not now but definitely in the nearest future so we are very much open to um to um membership we are still recruiting yes definitely we are still recruiting so you could literally join um through applications yeah, for membership of prevention you could as well volunteer to be um, to be a part of us probably doing our workshop um doing our workshop activities you could probably volunteer that or oh, you felt you could literally help in this part you could literally benefit in this part or whichever ways you know you could channel your curiosity in life science you could definitely come in we are very much open to accept you very very much open to accept you so um we in Saikun we are we are connected we are we are great minds of people set of people that look into life science related matters that benefit not only us but the society at large so and here we have today we have one of our great doctors on our one of one of the great potentials of nigeria and the in person of dr Agogo Ibo. Who he would be? Who who would be our host? I mean, who will be our speaker for today? Sorry, who will be our speaker for today? And you know, I'm very sure if you know this person, if you know how if you know how exposed she is in life science, cause I am in life science career, you definitely stick to the end of the program. And uh, and I'm very sure it can never be of a guess for you. You definitely get to learn a lot, a lot. I'm telling you, you definitely get to, to learn a lot. But before we start, before I get uh, my hand over the mic to her, I will definitely, I, I will definitely have to introduce her to you um, in terms of what she stands for and what she represents as well. So going for that, I, I not waste our, I I'm not waste our time anyways. So I we going I'm, I'm going to introduce her to us briefly. So Dr. Agogo Yibo is a biochemistry graduate from the University of Portacos. Yes, she graduated from the University of Portacos. She's a biochemistry. She's a biochemistry. Um, she had a master's in in science and um, in cancer research and um, molecular biology. So also she had a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. Both her masters and PhD was gotten from the University of Ibadan. Doctor once taught in she once taught biochemistry at DLC Nursing University Ibadan. She is a team member at Drosophila Research and Training Center Ibadan. She is one time member of CS DBT. Which is the um, US DBC um, fellow, who is actually which is actually the World Academic Science and the Department of Biochemistry of Ministry of Science and Technology that is situated in India. So, Doctor is a she is formerly a pre medical student lecturer at the Education Advanced Center at Wolowo. Bodhijai, pardon. And at currently, she's a lecturer at Queensland 
University at Belkuta. So I believe with this, with this uh, brief introduction that I've done regarding her, uh, you will be able to um, know what it is to expect that with the look of the chain of record that was being, I mean, that I've, that I've actually said a bit about, uh, you will be able to know that uh, this person is actually a core biochemistry and a science person in, uh, uh, in details. Yes, she's very, very detailed and very, very well um, um, endowed in knowledge related to science and you know, research, she's a research personnel and at the same time, she's a biochemist. So um, I'm very sure I am just as I am very, very, um, very, very anticipating, uh, anticipating to actually hear from her, to learn at her feet. So I believe we all at the same time are ready to learn at our feet as well. So um, I will say, let's welcome with our emoji and every possible means we believe we could say, just let's unmute ourselves and let's welcome doctor. Please, let's unmute ourselves and let's welcome doctor before she takes over. Welcome. welcome, Doctor. We're so happy to welcome, Doctor. Welcome, welcome, Doctor. You're welcome, you're welcome, ma. So we hand over the mic to you, ma. Please take over, ma. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation, ma. Thank you so much, ma. Over to you, Doctor. Over to you, ma. Oh, doctor, I believe it must have been a network issue. Just please let's be patient while she gets connected to us again. Please, let's be patient for a while. So yeah, I'm getting the network issue. Let's 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 be patient enough, please. Let's let's take some time. She'll be connected again. She'll get back to us right away. So why she why why we wait for her to join us? So I we um I we as well try to um I we continue by saying um through our recruiting process like we are as I said earlier we are still recruiting so do well to join the membership it's actually um a club you never you never regret to join we are you, you are never never going to regret to join stands for science and we um, we definitely doing our possible best in uh, seeking to what to stands for yeah we started in nigeria doesn't mean that we actually limited into nigeria yes we are looking into the globe and um, we are looking into the global universe in terms of like trying to go beyond Nigeria settings, trying to go beyond Africa. Yes, we are we, we definitely going. We are starting. Yes, nothing stopping us. We are moving. We are definitely moving, going forward beyond Nigeria. Yes. In the highest future, I'm very sure you definitely hear it in your on your billboard, on your TV stations, in every possible means you could see. Like, you know, trust me. There is for sure. It's definitely a matter of time. It's definitely a matter of time. So why we are with doctor to join us, please let's be patient enough, please. Let's be patient. Uh, 
Hello everyone. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, our host, um, Mr. Timothy, Scholar Timothy. Yes, yes sir. I need to yes, introduce a very important personality here today. Oh, wow. In fact, I didn't know that oh, wow. I'm going to be present for this meeting. Let me unmute. Let me show my face. All right. I would like to introduce to everybody Dr. Amos Abolaji. Wow. He's an associate wow. professor at University of Ibadan, and he's also the team lead at um, Dosofila Research Training, Ibadan Basharun. So, guys, let's welcome him. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I never knew we have uh, we have a great personnel in our midst today. Wow, welcome, so, welcome, sir. It's an honor to have you today. So, so, so great to be your presence. And uh, yeah, glory to God. Uh, doctor is back in our midst. So, you're welcome, ma. You're welcome, ma. So, we hand over the mic to you, ma. Thank you so much, ma. Thank you so much for connecting back. Thank you so back. much. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful. And I'm really sorry for that. Um, this connection of my network. Um, so let me quickly share my slide. I want to appreciate the um, invite for giving me fit to pick me <laughs> to, to speak on this topic when we have great people all day. My mentor is presently with us, um, Dr. Imos Abolaji, um, where he has trained us and uh, mm. so we have to to do just just what he has taught us to do. So thank you so much, sir, for the upbringing. And I know that um, this presentation is going to go well. So I hope we can all see my slide. Yes, can we see my slide? Yes, we can. So, um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma we can see it, ma'am. I will first of all share um, secondary school students with us, or, or we are all university or post-secondary um, post school students. Do we have secondary school students on this? I'm sorry. Are we all. So please, in... if we are secondary school students, please identify. Majorly, we, I just want to know do we most have of us are undergraduate? Okay, most people are undergraduate, but I think I saw a hand raised up for secondary school. So, oh, basically, yeah, today definitely. again, I'm Dr. Varsity, and I'm also a member of the Josephila Research and Training Center in Ibado. And um, today's topic is a very interesting one. Why? Because we are going to be talking about a model that seems seemingly very unique in research. So our topic again is Josephila research or Josephila model as a Josephila Mungasa as a model organism in biomedical research. I would love to put my slide on slideshow. So give me some minutes to put my slide on slideshow. Um, thank you. So I think we can see it now. Can you see it? It's on slideshow. So I hope we can all see it. So in the course of my presentation, I'll be guided by this following outline during the presentation. So personally, I have a teaching philosophy which talks about um, building lives through questions, creativity, practice, and experience. So as you interact with people, as you interact with environment, basically we ask questions. And as you ask questions, you tend to learn. And then you also have, um, that you, you get exposed and you become creative. And because of that, you have to practice what you get exposed to. And then that leads to different experiences or different life experiences and through that you are able to reach out to people you are able to change people through the help of god from the look of things i think uh, most of us here are believers and so if i say through the help of god i don't think it's 
out of place. But basically, first of all, we have to look at what exactly is research. Because we're talking about Josephina Menungasa as an, a modern organism in biomedical research. What then exactly is research? Because we must understand what research is for also be able to use Josephina Menungasa in studying biomedical research. So research basically for those in um, secondary school, I remember when I was in SS1, they taught me what science is that you have to observe, you have to ask question, and then you create hypotheses. Basically, that is research. So research is a systematical process of collecting, analyzing information to increase the understanding of the world. We do research for the good of the world. We do research for the good of our environment. We do research to make our environment better. Research basically is not supposed to be for the negative purpose. It's meant to be for a positive purpose. Yes, of course, people use research for negative purpose, but it's basically not meant to be for a negative purpose. So as you collect data, as you analyze those information, whatever information you get for, for me is supposed to increase the understanding of the world and then probably give you a phenomenon in which you are able to now say, oh, this is what exactly is happening now and all of that. So that basically is research. And so during the course of research, there are a lot of things that, that gets involved. We, we ask questions, we collect data, we have to formulate an hypothesis. Like, first of all, you must identify what a problem is problem in the environment, the problem in your society, okay? And then when you see a problem, you now say, okay, I want to create a solution. And because of that, you have to identify an hypothesis in relation to that problem. So for example, let me give you an example. For example, there's a problem of um, people becoming diabetic. And then I observe that probably when people take um, bitter leave, eh, or probably when people take um, bitter cola or bitter leaf, um the the level of being diabetes reduces why because diabetes is as a result of an of a, a, a increase in sugar level in the system that is not um being transformed because insulin level is either uh, affected or is not functioning and so i said okay i will create an hypothesis that it's possible that when you take bitter leaf is going to reduce the effect of diabetes. So that is just an hypothesis. That here is not the solution. And so you create an hypothesis. And because of that, you now go ahead to carry out the experimental procedure, the methods. You begin to carry out different research or different study. You, know? you carry out uh, studies on glucose, on the animal, or on whichever model you are using. You begin to check different markers to check whether it is actually protecting it or is not protecting it. And at the tail end, you'll be able to come to a conclusion to say, okay, if it is protecting it, your hypothesis is good. If it is not protecting it, your hypothesis is on the alternate. Do you get it? So you create an hypothesis. And then another thing you also have to do is, after you have seen your result, you must also send it out to the world. You must also send it out to the world. How do you send it out to the world? Somehow, sometimes you can do publications. You, know? you publish your results. Sometimes you can go to radio stations and um, newspaper and all of that. And then you let them know what you are doing. And then as the government or those in science begin to see all of those things, they begin to implement it in our society, and our society becomes more better. So these are the steps in research. You observe, so a good researcher or a good scientist must have the ability to observe. You must be able to observe your environment, be able to observe. It is until you observe, that is when you will identify a problem. If you are not observative enough, you will not be able to identify problems. So it is good you, you, you are keen enough to observe what is happening. Um, observation is very necessary. And then you begin to raise questions. As you observe and 
question begins to raise up within you okay why is this so why what can we do to prevent this you get questions begin to raise up and when those questions comes up you don't just jump into the questions what do you do you go and carry that literature search oh have this thing been done before what is people's idea about this what have they done earlier and all of that you know you carry out literature, literature search how do you do that you go to google you go to PubMed. you have senior colleagues you even read newspaper and all of that you just carry out literature search to know the knowledge of that thing and then to know what exactly you should do it will when you carry out literature search it will give you a wider knowledge of what is it and then what have not been done and what can you do do you get that and so when you do that you'll be able to get an hypothesis and i say okay this is what i want to do and then you create an hypothesis after that you go ahead to carry out your experiments and after carrying out your experiment you analyze your results yeah? begin to analyze your results to see okay is my result positive is it negative now i must say that a negative result does not mean that your result is not good so you don't need to dot your result you don't need to make it follow whatever it has been said on the literature no give your result the way it is and then you come to a conclusion after which you begin to share you share it out you you, you make presentations you go to conferences you um, make publications radio stations you put small syndicate meetings stop people might like do outreaches about all of those those are parts of sharing what you have observed and then you can develop further interventions and all of that so that is part of it now biomedical research remember our topic is on biomedical research so when we're talking about researcher working to improve the health and well-being of humans and animals remember Remember that our environment are not just made up of humans. Our environment are made up of humans, animals, plants. So when we talk about biomedical research, improving the health or the total well-being of humans and animals, that is where your, your research is focused on. So you must begin to know, oh, what kind of research am I really interested in? What exactly do I want to do? Am I interested in saving life? Yes, you may not be a doctor, but as a researcher or a bio a medical researcher you can affect lives also you can affect lives also you can affect the animals you can affect the environment around you and so these are some types of biomedical research now biomedical research is not streamlined to make sane oh we will remember we are talking about well-being but yet it is not streamlined to being a medical doctor so now we have some to be a medical doctor but is god exactly saying you should be a medical doctor what is god purpose for your life what is god telling you are you just designed to become a medical doctor because of being a medical doctor i remember my story i always wanted to be a medical doctor and so i went uh, after my secondary school i wanted to be a medical doctor but somehow my jump score was not up to and so someone said oh don't just do biochemistry and then after your year one you can cross to be a medical doctor of course i got um i think i got 3.8 and then i was supposed to cross 3.98 and i was supposed to cross at four point and so i couldn't cross and then i still wanted to become a medical doctor so even when i was in school my aim or my perspective was i am going to be a medical doctor so i came out good to one and i was in nyc serving the lord and do what i want to do and then i picked up a book um by brother billy akane which said that um living in eternity in view and so i began to reason again what exactly was my purpose of wanting to become a medical because even in uh, nyc i was saying oh yes even after i need these things i'm going for direct entry i'm going to study medicine and all of that and then i reasoned again my purpose and i began to see that that purpose of me being a medical doctor was actually a selfish reason it was not what exactly because you know i i just saw the way god was preventing me from becoming a medical doctor and i'm like ew it was basically god that was doing it so what exactly is god calling you into you must begin to know 
from now are you in secondary school you must begin to know have that personal relationship with god and know what is god calling you into so we have different types of research in basic medicine biomedical research you can be in the basic medical research so basic medical research like biochemistry physiology anatomy pharmacology all of those are basic medical research you can be in applied medical research and then you can also be in clinical medical research those in as medical doctors as pharmacies as uh, you know dentists and all of that those ones are clinical chemical parts and all of those ones that clinical but the major thing is that all of these are working together to make the uh, human so animal total well-being good and so there is no um as a biochemist i don't feel inferior in trust i feel at the top of the world because there's basically nothing i cannot apply for that i will not see a biochemist there oh um, i'm not um saying that everybody should go to biochemistry but there's basically nothing you want to apply for outside the country or within the country that you will not see the need of a biochemist that they will not say oh, oh biochemists can apply for this i see saw something today and they were saying biochemistry if you have the biochemistry degree you can apply for it so it's a very good opportunity are you in physiology are you in anatomy you are needed you are vital if you were not writer medical doctors will not study that before they move into the clinicals it is the basic the same way said is basic structural functional units of life so the basic medicine or medical science those in the basic medical science are the basis for science that's what they are the basis if that part is not properly known then the clinicals are not going to do well so that part is also very essential and so we can carry out basic me medical science or basic medical research using different strategies different methods as basic medical researchers i can decide to carry out my research by either a chemical or mechanical method even by computer stimulation now we have we know what we do as a as a um, bar statistics or by informatics sorry oh uh, those people are uh, computer simulations they're trying to know oh the chemical models in which models are interacting with different molecules and what is happening in the system it is very essential is the basis also and sometimes we can do it through in vitro methods in vitro is that it is not in the living cell it is not inside the living organism that's what i'm saying it's not in the living organism it's outside the living organism so something like cell culture or tissue culture that is in vitro when you bring out an organ outside and then you begin to grow it to watch it to see what is happening that is in vitro we also have non-human studies oh so i want to carry out research i can begin to say oh what are things i can use to know because do you know that most of these animals when we're doing evolution there's a way evolution went through so they have similar genetic makeup to that of humans and it becomes basically it is difficult for you to just say hey human okay i want to use you for research but you can pick a lower animal and begin to use for research to understand the process of that disease or that condition and all of that and then after which you cannot transfer your study to humans so you can use non-human study like rats rodents the drosophila model the c elegans all of those ones you can use them okay you have the human study too now most clinic chance use those in the clinical study they use human study because they are in direct contact with the patient so they use human studies and so you can do that too. and then you can also do epidemiological study just carry by uh, data do questionnaires ask questions they will take yes no and all of that and then with that you'll be able to analyze so there are different studies that can be done so don't be streamlined don't be too rigid be willing to learn expose yourself being ready to, to to learn oh and so we have a selected model organism in biomedical research one of these selected model organism or some of them we have zebra fish that is one model that is being used we also have the sophila model we also have the c elegant 
rodent model. These are different models that are being used in biomedical studies. Different models being used in biomedical studies. But today we are going to focus on Drosophila menomigaster. You see how tiny this fly is. However, it's very, very, very essential in biomedical studies. So why do we decide to choose Drosophila menomigaster? One basic reason is that it has fundamental principle of genetics and development. I must tell you that the first study that was done with Drosophila was done using genetics and development. In secondary school, we learned about a red eye fly and white eye fly. That was the that they were using. So, genetics developmental studies can be done. You can understand it better. Now, human diseases, human health and diseases also. You can relate it with the Sophila Mungasa, human health and diseases. You can relate it to that. And then, do you know that with this model, um, a lot of scientific Nobel Prize have been won with this model. A lot of scientific Nobel Prizes have been won with this model. A lot have been won using this model. Uh, these are some of the Nobel Prizes that have been won using this model. Recently, in uh, 2017, the psychiatry reading was won using this model. So we have a lot of um, of 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 goodness using the sophila menomigasta we still have other reasons why we should use the sophila menomigasta another reason is that it is very affordable for the years i've been using the to, to to work um you know it's like they have a very good community of friends such that oh i want to fly i just come uh, i know someone that has it i ask for the fly and then the person just sense to me and all of that they have very very affordable affordable to maintain also and eh? very cheap things just corn meal ega ega and yeast the normal yeast used in baking and then little of uh, ethanol very cheap things is very easy and then as we go on they are constrained on ethical of uh, uh, Ethical use of other animals, higher animals like rodents. Outside the country, you cannot just pick rats and say, oh, I want to use rats. No. Or I want to use monkey. They are ethical constraints to their uses. And so, Josephila have little or no ethical constraint. I know we must have heard about the three arrows, replacement, reduction, and refinement. So you can use it. It multiplies easily. For example, it, is, it will be difficult for me to use 2,000 rats at a time, but I can basically use 2,000 Josephila at a time to do my research with little, with little or no, no effect on me. And then their genetic similarity to that of man is also very high. 60%, if a student scores 60%, that is B. So 60% of genetic similarity to that of human gene. And then, to so disease associated with human, they have 75 patients. So we can see that there is high potential in the use of the sophila menomigas. I've already talked about the three arrows also. Now, another thing is that this Josophila genome avoided been characterized very well. It has been characterized very well. It has four chromosomes, and in that chromosome, we have 15,500 genes. But what about humans? The number of chromosomes is 23. You see, it is high. It is easier to look at something that is small, few in number compared to much. Uh, and then these have 22,000 genes. So the number of chromosomes here is quite small. And then you can also use it, the different uh, part of it, to study different uh, things. Easy genot uh, genotypic typing is easy for you to and uh, uh, fill them and all of that. It's very easy. They also have a stock center where you can order for the type of fly you need. For example, there are genetic models of flies, practicing disease genetic model, uh, cancer. And it, assuming you want to mutate a gene, it is possible. You just tell them the gene, they will mutate it, and you have that type of flies. And then you just cross and you're able to get the type of fly which you need. But for animals, it will be very, 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 very expensive for you to do that. So it is quite easy 
to do with the Sofila Mungasa. Another thing is that almost all, all the stages of this fly can be used because the Sofila Mungasa have four stages. You have the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. All the stages from the egg to the larva to the pupa to the adult, all the stages can be used for basic medical study, all of them. So there is no waste. There's no waste that you know, oh, okay, let me throw this. No, there's no waste. All stages can be used in the biomedical study. All stages of the fly can be used in biomedical study. We also have similarities in the organs. Some people will say, oh, so is there this organ and all of that? There is similarity in the organ. For example, this green part in human is the green part also in Josephilla. So there's a salivary gland. We have the osophagus also, the blue part. There's also the stomach, which is the crop in Josophila. We also have insulin producing cell. Uh, in humans, you have insulin cell. And that is that that helps a uh, glucose storage absorptively producing cell also in Josophila. You have the GIT meat guts in Josophila in humans also. You also have the intestine and all of that. And of course, you also have uh, the fat body cell. The fat body cell is synonymous with the liver. So the fat bodies of humans. So they have similarities. However, there are some things which are different. Of course, for example, uh, um, Josephilla does not have blood, but he have limbs. Um, so there, there are some things. So you must, first of all, be able, as I said, you must be able to look at papers, what have been done, what can I do, and all of that. You don't just dive into uh, things. So you must be able to check to understand. So now, what to talk about uh, biomedical research in depthly now. And so I'm going to talk about selected model of inducing diseases in Josephilla. You know, we said that biomedical research, you are trying to talk about the well-being. Well-being, how do you um, make humans well compared to our, in our environment? Because we are exposed to a lot of things. So what do you do? Basically, you know, in our environment, we are exposed to a lot of chemicals. Yeah. Intentionally or intentionally, as you are working on the way that exhaust coming to you. There are different air you are taking in, which you don't even know what it is. The food we eat, the, the, the crops, some of them have absorbed some chemicals from the soil that is not good from the, from, from the environment. And we take them in and all of that. So intentionally or, or intentionally, we get exposed to different chemicals. And these chemicals are so wide in our environment. There are so many diseases. They lead to different diseases like, like neurodegenerative diseases, diabetes, cancer, reproductive dysfunction diseases, a lot, a lot of diseases. This is this chemicals lead to. But I'm just going to pick some few chemicals here, and then I will tell you how the sofila was used in relation to this chemical. So, but before we go in depthly, some of us you may be wondering, how do we induce this chemical to just feel like that? Ah, that tiny, tiny thing, that tiny fly, how, how, how come can we cause them, induce this chemical to this Josephilla? So we have different way of inducing it. Sometimes, some can be injected. We don't do injection here in our lab, eh? but you can, there's a very tiny needle in which you can use to in, inject them. What you just need to do is to make them sleep and exercise them to sleep, and then you're able to inject them. Another thing you can do is to in, put them, put whatever you want to expose them to in the diet. So as they feed on it, they get exposed to it. The same way humans do. Sometimes we get exposed to things through the diet we eat. So you can miss that thing you want to give to them in their diet. So as they feed on it, or as they feed on it, they get exposed to it. Another way is that you can allow them to inhale inhalation. Allow them to inhale that thing. Allow you to inhale that that so that is true inhalation. And then of course, 
you can also go through the genetic way of mutating a gene and then yeah, they get exposed to it. But I will talk more about the chemically induced way. How do we induce it chemically? And so these are some of some chemicals we have used or or that have been used in Josephula. One of that chemical is for venin cyclohexene. And they also use the metabolite. This work was done by um, Dr. Amos Abolaji in Brazil. So that was what he used. That was his first contact actually with Josephilla. And so that was what he used to induce it. And basically, this chemical has been shown to cause reproductive dysfunction. And it affects the um, primary follicles of the reproductive organ. So it affects the ovaries of females so when he did this he observed that by the time he induced them with this dosophila he observed that um with this chemical he observed that one major organism to which for venous cyclohexene induced toxicity in dosophila is via the reduction of um antioxidant enzyme yeah and so why, how does it happen? It's because of accumulation of reactive oxygen species. Accumulation of people go and study major diseases. A lot of diseases arises as a result of reactive oxygen species. On the dative stress, when there's an imbalance between the antioxidant and the reactive oxygen species, that will lead to what they call oxidative stress. And when that happens, a lot of diseases comes as a result of that and that can lead to effects on it can affect the gene can begin to affect the gene can begin to affect the proteins and all of that and so he went ahead to look at some of those genes and he saw that it actually led to a uh, misregulations of the genes because those genes basically help to maintain the body system so it meant to it led to misregulation of the gene um so that is some of it and so it didn't just stop there. Sometimes we feel, oh, apart from exposed, being exposed to the uh, parent compound, what will happen? The fact is that when um, people or organisms get exposed to this parent compound, the liver in that system, basically our liver, our liver helps in metabolism. So the liver helps to break down that parent compound. And so you have what we call the metabolite. But metabolites are the substrates something that comes from the period compound they call that the metabolites um so we have the metabolite and so you also look at okay this thing is broken down to different metabolites does this metabolite does it have toxic effects also and then he observed that the metabolite also had toxic effects on the system oh uh, and basically how do they do that he saw that the metabolite inhibits what we call the um the tire group it inhibits the thio group that is present in that en in this enzyme eh? amino novini dehydrogenase enzyme it inhibits that thio group and as a result of that it keeps generating a uh, free radicals and that leads to oxidative stress so that was how it occurred and so for that in even in our lab presently we've done a work using sucrose to induce what we call hyperglycemia hyperglycemia is one of the symptoms of diabetes those of us that did a uh, diabetes mellitus in any way you will see that they, they used to tell us uh, the person will have hyperglycemia hyperdysia uh, hyperuria like urinating frequently um taking water frequently high level of sugar so what did we do we just gave this flight sucrose gave them sucrose there's a percentage of sucrose that 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 was given to them and that led to hyperglycemia and how did we know that they were hyperglycemic because we now check the glucose level in the fly we homogenized them and did uh, determine the glucose level and then we saw that the flies that were given sucrose had higher glucose level compared to the control so when you are doing basic research you must have a control group eh the control group we have a negative control group and we have a positive control group the negative control group is your control that has um distilled water like it doesn't take anything it's distilled water 
The positive control group is the one that takes the torsicant alone. And then, assuming you want to now ameliorate, like treat it, you now have your plant also. So that is also a way of carrying out research. So this is the Sophila Mungasa. They were able to induce hyperglycemia, and then they checked and they saw that high glucose level leads to obesity, and it can lead to insulin resistance. And these were other papers that have been carried out using Drosophila meningasta. However, this one was carried out in our lab, and there we used the uh, esculent tincture. That was what we used in treating the hyperglycemia that was induced. And then we saw that this uh, compound, this compound actually gotten from seafood. We saw that it was very, very good, or it was good to protect against a uh, diabetes. So actually, we have things in our environment that can be protective, which we look down on. Some of them are herbs, some of them are the little animals or the crabs, seafood. What created the word is that it gave all herbs for plants for our good for us to eat. However, we must also take caution because at a certain dose, there may be a protective, it may be protective, but at another dose, it can become toxic. You know, something may be protective, but when you take it extremely or something, it may become toxic. So we must also be very cautious. And so we also have gone ahead to look at um, using different environments and toxicants. Heavy metals. We get exposed to heavy metals in our environment. There are different industries. They just put in their waste into the uh, water bodies. We have a uh, refinery. They just allow their fumes to come into our environment. People are constantly mining, breaking mountains, breaking walls, and all of these minerals or heavy metals get into the environment. They get into our crops. We take in the crops and we get exposed to them one way or the other, even through our water, because they wash into the water bodies and from that water bodies, we take waters and all of that. So we have copper. We have looked at copper. We have looked at aluminum. We have looked at retinol. Retinol is finally used in, let me say, carpets and all of that. We have looked at NP50 also using Josephilla. And we have seen that most of them can induce neurotoxicity. So this work was carried out by Dr. Amos Abolaji and his MSc uh, student, Kenny and uh, Shizim. And so they looked at copper. And then they saw that copper actually could induce oxidative stress. And it doesn't just induce oxidative stress. It led to neurotoxicity. It affected the neurons, the brain of the Drosophila. It led to neurotoxicity. And then, they, what did they now do? They used something that was present, that was beneficial to us, cucumin. Cucumin is present in our environment. We take it. We eat it. And so they used cucumin to try to see, and they saw that cucumin actually was protective against the um, copper-induced oxidative stress that was present in Josephila, and also prevented the neuro toxicity that have been induced earlier. And then another thing they notice is that sometimes these chemicals do not just cause oxidative, it also affects lifespan. It reduces the survivor. So you, some, now we hear that people die much early. And you hear that at, at 48, somebody is dead. At 50, somebody is dead. And all of that. Some of these things, as a result of things that we get exposed to, they are, it's reducing the lifespan of people in our environment. It's reducing the lifespan of people. And so it is very essential. We, we, we take precautions of what we get exposed to, even while we are doing research. We take precautions. It's very essential. We take precautions. Now, chemically induced model of Parkinson's disease. This one was done using MPTC. And so this chemical is... When you induce it, it will cause Parkinson's disease. And one way we saw is that it reduced the lifespan. Look at the control here and see the different doses that were used. It has already dropped to like zero. The control is still far up. So things we get exposed to with this, we'll be able to know ah, why is it that this set of people, why is it that they stay longer? What is happening? 
what do we really get exposed? You'll be able to know and begin to, you, it will also give you a greater awareness on how to prevent those exposure. And then they use respiratory. Oh, respiratory oh. is found in, uh, in grape. Uh, hello. Yeah, is somebody saying something? Yeah, sorry, sorry, doctor. So please, I want to pass a, a very important message that the missing liquid was actually scheduled to be one hour, which should be ending soon in less than in, in less than five minutes. Oh. So we actually well, have I um, think because a we are new using link that is up on the message. Listen, yes, we are using Google Meet, so it will not go off. You don't need oh. to. It won't go off yet. I've been using Google Meet for for a long time, for like three hours, and it will go off. Let's just be on. I don't think it will go off because we are using Google Meet. As you mean it was Zoom, it will go off. Okay. All right. Man. Yeah. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So I'm sorry. I didn't know I have a short time, so I will rush. I will. I will. I will. I will round up now so that we can have question or. No. My actually you have. Hello, ma. Yeah, I'm listening. Yes, my actually I have like an hour to talk and then like 30 minutes for question and answer. Oh that's like 30 minutes. Yes, ma. Oh. It's because of this um short time of Google Meet link. No, I'm trying to go off. I know they they, they sent a warning about um that they will start doing this, but they have not started implementing it. I've been using it for some time, so it won't go off. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So we have um um, for example, we use resveratrol here, and then we saw that resveratrol prolongs the lifespan. And what did we do? We took this resveratrol back to that MPTT um, flies that reduced lifespan, and we saw that it actually prolonged the lifespan. It also was beneficial against the behavioral defects because it was practicing disease that MPTT induced. So it's it protected against that behavioral defect and then also ameliorated the oxidative damage that have been occurred. Now, it is not only oxidative stress that you can check. As a researcher, you must what what you do is that oh, you, you what comes to your mind is what exactly am I interested in? What do I want to do? So if you want to do something like um uh, you you first of like biochemistry, they will tell you don't look at the pathway. So you must know exactly the pathway that you are interested in. It is that pathway you are interested in that will determine the kind of assay you will carry. So when I talk about oxidative, we are carrying out oxidative stresses because yes, the, the, the individual who carried out the research was interested in that. In some of them, we also did inflammatory uh, tests. So we did something like NO. Sometimes we also went ahead to do inflammatory markers. So you must know the part where you are interested in. That will help you to determine the kind of assay or the kind of test to carry out. So it is very essential. Your basic literature review must be done. So you must be able, you cannot just, just say, oh, just read any here. No. And that will help you to uh, streamline your, 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 this thing, your guide. So that when you finish gathering your results, your result will be telling a story. Will not be haphazard, green year and there, you'll not be able to bring it together. No, you must be able to know what you are interested in, what part, what mechanism are you interested in. Oh, sorry, I'm using mechanism because I'm a biochemist, because there are uh, pathways in the system and there are different pathways. So you must be able to know what you're interested in, and that will help you to determine the result or the kind of assays that you want to carry out. And that will help you to do it. So some of these assets can be carried out in different ways. For us, we homogenize and then we carry out a uh, read, we, we read with our spec. But it is not only spec you can do. You can do anti-ELISA, that is antigen antibody binding. After carrying out to homogenize, you can do microscopy. And you stay with an antibody, carry out immunohisto. Eh? Stay with an antibody and then you check under the microscope. Eh? You can do, uh, there are a lot of things you can do with these flies. In short, it is we in Nigeria that are doing mostly uh, homogenization. In outside the country, just with the lava, we we'll just stain and then check under the microscope. And you begin to see beautiful results, beautiful reactions to the flies and all of that. So it is very essential. I just want you to know that it is not just that you can do. So it depends. Just read wide, know what you are interested in, be able to cover what you are interested in and then you cannot do what you are interested in so this one was done using 
your cola viral and the gatina cola, which is your bitter cola. Oh, and so they saw that the bitter cola actually increased lifespan. Why are we interested in lifespan? Because if there's toxicity, toxicity is going to affect lives. It's going to affect the lifespan, and it's also going to lead to different affect different mechanisms that we affect or uh, that will lead to the death of that person. Death does not just occur automatically. There are a lot of things that must have gone through that must have happened for death to occur, even for humans. A lot of things because basically God created us or created living things in such a way that there's a way the living organism maintain what we call homostasis in the system. There's a kind of homostasis, a kind of regulatory system that occurs. But if